Welcome to Tuesday's Noon Zoom with the Chambers Women's Week presented by American One Credit Union. I'm Janelle Merritt, Vice President of Community Partnerships at American One. We're excited today to focus on health, specifically on women's health. We've already had great content this morning and we look forward now to hearing from Dr. Rose Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the Chief Medical Officer at the Center for Family Health. Dr. Johnson is here to give us some information on women's heart health, equipping us with strategies to be a healthier community and empowering us with knowledge for change. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for sharing with us today. We appreciate you taking the time and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Janelle, for the introduction. Um, I am uh, really happy to be here today, um, and I am very, very happy to be part of the Women's Week here. Um, so as Janelle said, um, I am Rose Johnson. I am the CMO at the Center for Family Health, the Chief Medical Officer here. I have been working at the center since 2003 now, and um, I enjoy the work here very, uh, very much. I am honored and it's my great pleasure to be here today to be able to talk about um, healthy heart um, in women. And I want to thank, thank um, Tim Booth and the Chamber of Commerce for giving me this opportunity to do this today. Um, I am going to take a minute to be able to share my screen here so that I can share my slides and then go on to the presentation. So just give me a minute. Share. 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 This one? Okay. I'm hoping that all of you can um, see my screen now. All right, so I am going to go ahead. Um, and start from here. Please let me know if you can't hear me clearly or if you cannot see my screen. All right, so I'm going to talk about coronary. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm going to, I had some Stephanie in my office, so I had my mask on and I'm going to take it off now then. So thank you. I am going to be talking about um, coronary artery disease, um, which in short form is CAD. Um, and I'd like to talk uh, first, uh, write down my agenda, which is first I'd like to present some data. Um, then I'd like to talk about the various risk factors, um, clinical presentation, um, lifestyle changes, um, testing that is done, and the treatment. So um, coronary artery disease is the most common cause of death in women in the United States. Um, we do, um, you know, think about and worry about various kinds of cancers like breast cancer and cervical cancer in women, and, and that is very important. But it is also really important that we think about um, a healthy heart in women and to be aware that this is the most common cause of death um, in women in the United States. Um, it is also the most common type of heart disease. So there are um, various kinds of heart disease where we could have AFib, which is an irregular heartbeat, or valve issues. Um, but the most common cause is um, the most common type, sorry, of heart disease is coronary artery disease. And like all of you know. Um, what this means is there is a blockage in the artery that is to the heart, one or more arteries to the heart um, that uh, causes areas of decreased circulation um, and can lead to a heart attack. Um, I want to mention um, the relationship to various other diseases that are similar. Um, so there is what's called cerebrovascular disease, for which uh, under that would come, for example, stroke or what we call TIA, um, um, which is where you get some stroke symptoms for maybe a few hours and it goes away. Another condition is what we call peripheral artery, arterial disease, which is when there is a problem in the circulation in our um, in the arteries in our extremities, especially in the legs. 
um, aortic arteriosclerosis is when there is a, a blockage or, or um, clog, clogged arteries, uh, fatty deposits in the aorta. And uh, the other condition is abdominal and aortic aneurysm. So all of these are very closely related. And if um, somebody has an issue, a problem in any one of these areas, it could be, um, it could very well increase the risk in the other um, territories also. And all these conditions together um, are called um, cardiovascular disease. Some uh, data that I wanted to present is um, heart attacks. The risk dramatically increases after menopause. Now, we don't know 100% why that is, and I'm sure that the fact that we are, you know, we, we're getting older, of course, when we go through menopause adds to it, but uh, it is thought that there is some other effect also that we're not 100% sure of at this time. Um, one in nine women between the ages of 45 to 64 will develop some form of cardiovascular disease. And once we get to age 65 and over, that ratio goes up to one in three. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty dramatic increase at that point. Um, the good news here is actually in the past 40 years, CAD or coronary artery disease has actually decreased. Uh, the mortality, sorry, I apologize. The mortality from coronary artery disease has decreased. Um, and we, the thought is, studies have shown that this is due to risk reduction. Um, there's been a reduction in smoking, there's been an improve, uh, improvement in the diet, and this has led to the decrease in mortality. Now, during this period, there's also been some increase in weight, which actually might have um, kind of dampened those results a little bit and maybe even increased, caused a little bit of increase in the mortality. But overall, there's been a reduction, which is, which is very good news. Um, next, I want to talk about um, risk factors. Um, if there is a personal history of coronary artery disease or CAD, that is uh, definitely a huge risk factor. As we grow older, age 55 or greater, that's another risk factor. Um, a family history of what we would say premature coronary artery disease, that would be if it happens in a first degree relative. And if it's a male, it's less than 50. If it's a female, less than 60 years. Hypertension or high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, um, kidney disease, smoking. So um, I want to pause there for a second and just mention these risk, risk factors are pretty much similar in both uh, men and women. Um, and if we are able to control some of these diseases, that will, um, that will help in decreasing the risk. So to, to talk about a few few examples, when we talk about high blood pressure, we want the blood pressure to definitely be below 140 by 90, maybe closer to even 130 by 80. Um, if we are able to maintain a blood pressure in that range, it will help to decrease um, the risk of coronary artery disease. Um, diabetes, controlled, if it remains controlled and what we mean by control, we measure diabetes in different ways, but generally if the sugar is in the low hundreds, so 90 to 120 range, um, that will also decrease the risk of diabetes. Um, I do wanna mention, of course, depending on um, the functional status of people, of women as men, as well as men, and depending on the age, the, um, the level we wanna maintain the sugar will, will vary, but the number I gave you was just a general, general recommendation is around um, 90 to 120. Um, cholesterol, another risk factor. Um, we have cholesterol and triglycerides, fats that are there in our body, both of which can result um, in deposits, fatty deposits in the arteries and result in coronary artery disease. So it's, it's again important that we, um, we try to put that under control um, through, through diet, exercise, uh, and medications. Um, kidney disease um, and smoking were two others. And smoking is, as we all know, detrimental in various 
different ways, not, um, not just for the heart, but also there are several, there's lung cancer, um, COPD. So um, it is definitely a huge risk factor for various diseases. Um, I want to um, talk about the next few things, which actually kind of is um, more specific to women. Um, like we mentioned earlier, postmenopausal. Um, as we grow older and we get to our postmenopausal stage, the risk of coronary artery disease goes up. Um, again, like I was saying earlier, we do not know 100% the reason uh, for it. Um, however, studies have shown that hormonal replacement does not, does not really make a difference. It does not decrease the risk for um, heart coronary artery disease. Um, psychological stress. Psychological stress is a huge risk, again, in, um, in both men and women, but especially in women. Um, and it's, it's important that um, we all work toward um, decreasing the stress in our life. I do realize it's much more easier said than done, but um, it does play a huge role in various uh, medical conditions um, and definitely in coronary artery disease. Um, um, the other one would be inflammatory or rheumatic diseases. Um, and then again, pregnancy-related complications. So if um, a pregnant uh, woman had complications in the form of eclampsia, preeclampsia, spontaneous pregnancy loss, preterm labor, and again, gestational diabetes or high blood pressure, that puts them at a higher risk of having coronary artery disease. And, and I will, as I said, as I was saying, a lot of these risk factors are similar in men and women, but again, the, the last few ones are a little more specific, are more specific for women. Um, some other unique risk factors for female, just trying to stress on that, would be like we said before, menopause, pregnancy complications. And I also want to mention early menarche. Um, it is, studies show that if um, a girl starts their um, men uh, periods, their menstruation below the earlier than the age of 13 years, there is an increased risk for coronary artery disease in, um, in women. So we go down to the symptoms. Um, again, a lot of the symptoms are very similar both in men and women. Um, chest pain, as we all know, is actually the most common symptom that we see. One difference, um, or maybe a couple of differences in women is that it could be, again, at rest or sleep in women, um, while in men, and it, to clarify, in women, it can also be uh, during exertion, but it can also be at rest and sleep. And a lot of times we think of exertional chest pain related to um, heart disease, but we need to remember that it can also be addressed or sleep, and it can be brought about by stress in women. Um, other symptoms a lot of us may be familiar with is uh, breathing problems, just feeling tired. Um, it could be um, not being able to do what they used to do before, not being able to walk, um, as long as they used to before, maybe you know, a woman would come in and say, you know, I used to be able to walk three or four blocks. I don't feel like I'm able to do that. I used to climb two flights of stairs um, without having to stop. Now I have to stop after the first flight of stairs. So, so things like that are all red flags that we need to be aware of. Um, nausea, vomiting, sweating, um, feeling like a heart's pounding, beating fast, feeling dizzy are all um, symptoms. And they don't all have to be together, you know, it could be isolated, they could have come, you know, uh, and a uh, female or a male could have uh, multiple symptoms too. Now, generally women with, um, heart, with a coronary artery disease or CAD are 10 years older than uh, men. Um, next, we'll go down to lifestyle changes. Smoking, I think, I think um, we always talk about smoking, smoking, smoking for everything, you know, uh, we blame smoking and, and, and it is, it is actually a huge risk factor like I was, you know, saying, mentioning earlier for multiple, uh, multiple medical issues. Um, 
if uh, we were able to stop smoking, it would decrease by half all of the coronary um, events, the risks for coronary events. That's pretty big. And uh, studies show that smoking even uh, one to two cigarettes, I think that's a typo, we don't need that width there, but if we smoke even one to two cigarettes a day, um, that can increase the risk. You know, so sometimes we'll have um, people who will say, that I, you know, I just smoke occasionally or just smoke one cigarette a day, but that does increase the risk. So it's really important that we work towards completely quitting uh, smoking. Um, it is, um, it's known that smoking is actually one of the, um, it is the most difficult addiction to quit. Um, it does unfortunately sometimes help to calm people down. So that can be, um, you know, one reason why it's very hard to, to quit smoking, but, we need to keep trying um, and, and there are, uh, we definitely know of several success stories where people have been able to quit smoking. Um, the risk um, of smoking actually increases threefold, uh, increases the risk of coronary artery disease by threefold in women and in men it increases the risk by twofold. Um, the second uh, thing I'd like to talk about is diet. Very important, um, you know, um, we, continue, we really push a very healthy diet now for multiple reasons, um, increasing fruits and vegetables in diets, in our diet, increasing, um, moving more towards consumption of fish and poultry and whole grains um, will help. Um, we want to, we want to work towards decreasing fatty foods, especially saturated fatty foods, um, towards eating more of, like I was saying, whole grains and cutting down on refined grains, cutting down on processed meats. Um, that, will, that will definitely help with overall health. Um, you know, one thing I, I, I do want to kind of mention about the diet is, you know, we see here a lot of different kinds of diets. We hear a lot of ads. Um, we, we hear about um, um, Ensure, you know, and, and things like that. What I what is important is that we are able to do a, make a change that sticks. Um, I think sometimes um, what we, we do is try to do something drastic, and then what happens is we're able to do it for a little bit of time, but then we go back to our previous ways because it, it's very hard. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the unhealthy food tastes really good, so it's really hard um, to to make a drastic change and to stick with it. So I, I would say one thing really important is to make um, small changes over a, a gradual period of time so that we're able to, to stick with those changes, um, hopefully for lifelong. lifelong. And, I, and you know, there are going to be times where we may um, go back, um, you know, and, 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 and have a day when we're not able to stick with that diet. And I, that's okay. That's okay so long as we're able to pick up and try to do better the next day. Because, I mean, it's, it's just a really hard thing to do. Um, avoid sedentary lifestyle. Um, we talk about exercise exercise all the time. Generally, um, what I would, I would say is about 30 minutes, if you could do um, exercise, which could be walking, brisk walking, 30 minutes, three to five times a week, that would be, that, that's good exercise. Um, I want to stress now, of course, so for somebody who is not exercising at all, it would be hard to go out and just, you know, do 30 minutes of brisk walking. So I, I tell people, you know, start slow, do whatever you can do, a slow walk, take, take the dog out for a walk, walk around the house, start with that and then gradually build it up. Um, you know, and, and I, we, we tell people, even if it's, you know, cold day or rainy day and you can't go out, even walking within the house, you know, walk up and down, um, stand in place in front of the TV if you're watching a program and, you know, just, just walk in place, that counts. Um, uh, there are chair exercises that we can do that helps. Um, so keeping ourselves moving, looking for any opportunity to move will help. We, we want to work toward 30 minutes, probably three to five times a week. But um, even like the previous things, like sitting in place and doing um, chair exercises, walking in place, all of that will, will help. Exercises is, is really important for overall, overall health. Well, next was exercise, which we talked about. Um, 
I want to mention one thing in relationship to um, diet and exercise. Also, we talk about weight loss, which is important. Um, one thing I want to stress on is um, abdominal obesity. So if we are, um, if we have an increased weight in an abdominal area, in our central area, that puts us at increased risk for coronary artery disease. So that's one of the measurements that's sometimes taken to see, okay, what's our risk for coronary artery disease. Um, stressful life situations. You know, it's, of course, it's been a, it's been a very stressful um, past year for um, a lot of people, some more than others. Um, and um, we want to work on trying to decrease that. And I know, as I said earlier, it is easier said than done. But um, again, I think, um, you know, I, I might sound like, you know, I'm just repeating myself, but exercise, especially on days when it is um, warm, when the sun is out, maybe going out for a short walk helps. Um, talking to people we trust, um, friends helps. Um, and so, and that, that is very important for uh, multiple situations, multiple medical issues, but definitely for coronary artery disease also. Um, alcohol intake, um, it's important that we cut down on um, minimized use of alcohol. Um, studies say that we want to minimize it to less than two drinks per day, and, and the effect seems to be more in women. Now, I would say, you know, even though we say less than two drinks per day, if if we were to drink two drinks every day, that would probably put us at increased risk for, um, for heart disease. Um, one of the important things with lifestyle is um, in women who have multiple risk factors for coronary artery disease or who have known heart disease, it is, it's very important that we do not do contraception with progestin, progestin estrogen combination because that would increase the risk for coronary artery disease uh, pretty significantly. So um, that's an assessment that we have to definitely do um, when we see women in the office. Um, anyone 20 years old or above um, should be assessed um, every three to five years. You don't usually need an assessment every year if, if for a healthy 20 year old, but every three to five years, depending on the risk factor, depending on family history, should have an assessment for coronary artery disease and other diseases also. Um, so that's really important that our youngsters also um, go for, for checkups um, at the doctor's office, at their provider's office. Um, so what, now what if we do, um, oops, sorry about that. Okay. Test for coronary artery disease. So, so let's say, you know, we are at the provider's office and, um, we, that there's any concern or we want to do further testing for coronary artery disease. Um, one of the tests that is done is blood test. And through blood test, uh, what we can find out is if somebody has um, diabetes, um, cholesterol, and that would, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that someone has um, coronary artery disease, but that would be a risk factor that we can um, treat, that we can, we can manage. Um, uh, vitals, very important because we check the blood pressure and that's, that's something we need to monitor and manage and keep under control. Um, an EKG is a test done, a very uh, simple test that's done uh, in the office. Um, and it does give us information. It gives us information as to what's going on in that moment. Um, we can always compare an EKG to a previous one to see if there's been changes and that'll give us some information. Um, on um, if there could be any heart problems going on, if we need to do further management, or if it's a completely normal EKG. Another test is a stress test, um, and there are various kinds of stress tests. So it's usually done if um, there is any suspicion or, or of coronary artery disease. And as you know, um, it could be done uh, with a treadmill. So, so, so basically what's done in a stress test is we are making, we're stressing the heart. Uh, by increasing the uh, rate, the rate at which the heart beats. Um, and when we do that, if the heart can withstand that, that usually means that it's, it's good, it's functioning well, and it's able to withstand stress. And if, if, um, if there are any changes um, in the EKG, that tells us that there could be something wrong. Um, and 
it can be done in two ways. So we could just stress the heart by making somebody run on a treadmill, which will make our heart beat much, much faster, or it could be done through medications, which would be a chemical stress test. And um, it's all, and, and, and uh, the cardiologist, the heart specialist looks at the stress test in two ways. They look at EKG, but they also look at images they take of the heart to see if there is um, any issues with blood circulation in the heart. And then the uh, other test that can be done is a cardiac catheterization, which is where the cardiologist will put in a catheter. Um, and it used to be through the groin in the past. It still is done through the groin, but now you know they can do it even through, uh, through the artery in the wrist. And they're able to go in, visualize the heart, arteries in the heart, um, and then are able to decide or see if there is any blockage, if the blockage is mild, if it's pretty significant, and even do, um, even treat it right then and there, which could be by uh, maybe even putting a stent in there, um, and which, which I will talk about in the next slide in just a minute. But those are some of the tests that can be done to assess um, coronary artery disease. And then we talk about treatment. Um, so under treatment, I still want to go back and stress lifestyle because I um, study show and I um, definitely agree lifestyle plays a huge role in overall health and definitely in coronary uh, in the prevention as well as treatment of coronary artery disease. Um, then we have medications. There are various, various kinds of medications. I'm not going to go into every single one, but I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Um, but uh, one of the commonly used ones, an aspirin, a great medication that is used um, for somebody who has known coronary artery disease. Um, it's a blood thinner. It helps to thin the medication. Uh, sorry, it helps to thin the blood. Um, and then we have other medications like, which are called beta blockers, AIDS inhibitors, medications for cholesterol. Um, and these pills um, help in different ways. They help uh, to um, like cholesterol, help to decrease the cholesterol level, or they help to remodel the heart. So there's multiple effects of these medications on the heart. The next thing is stenting, like we were talked about in, um, um, in the uh, when I mentioned uh, cardiac catheterization. If right when the um, cardiologist is doing the catheterization, if they see that there's a block, um, and if it's only in um, one, it, uh, it, well, it depends on which blood vessel is involved and also depends on the number of blood vessels because sometimes um, stenting will work. Sometimes they have to do surgery, which is the next option. So depending on what they find, they're able to stent the blood vessel or they may say, okay, we need to go into surgery. We need to do surgery. And then that would be the, the next step if necessary would be a bypass surgery. So um, that will be the end. That is all I had to talk about today. Um, and I will open it up to any questions that anybody might have. Dr. Johnson, I guess I have a question. This is Janelle. Hi, Janelle. I'm wondering about red meat. So can you give us the real deal on how yeah. bad is red meat? How much can we eat? How much should we not eat? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so if we consider red meat, like we all know, uh, beef, steak, uh, pork, um, it, is, it is significantly un uh, unhealthy more unhealthy than, than chicken. Um, chicken and fish um, are much healthier. So, and I, I never like to tell anybody not to eat it because I think if we don't eat something, we tend to crave it more. So um, what I generally will tell somebody, it, it depends on how much we eat. So if, if for someone who is able to give it up, that's awesome. If somebody cannot give it up, I would just say cut down. Um, uh, so let's say we're eating red meat every, every day. I'd say cut it down maybe to two to three times a week. Um, if you're only doing it once a week, maybe make it every other week. So, so that's I think I think we want to do um, we want to do what is possible, what's doable, and what we can sustain. Otherwise, it really doesn't help. Is is my thought process, and I think that's what we want to work towards. 
Thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? I hope that was informative and, and, and helpful. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Dr. Johnson, thank you very much for your time today and sharing this valuable information. Uh, these videos will be online um, at the um, Chamber's website uh, for the event, which is Jackson, jacksonwomensweek.com. So many more people will benefit from the information that you shared today. And again, thank you for your willingness to give of your time and expertise for uh, Women's Week. It's been a pleasure to have you, and it's been very insightful. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Absolutely. And I'm grateful for giving me the opportunity to do, the, to do this. I'm more than happy to, to be a part of the Women's Week. Thanks, Tim. It's absolutely our pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.